Sorry, I had. Uh, there we go. I'm I'm muted now. I had uh, trouble signing in, and I'm admitting people now. Okay. Can I? Should I share my screen and get the PowerPoint? Okay. Don't worry, it's a water, not a beer. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, 10 o'clock, but I'm going to uh, wait another minute or two for our latecomers before we get started. Well, at least the chime feature is off. I was on a Zoom call with, I think, 100 people the other day, and it chimed every time someone joined. Oh, oh no. And not everyone was on time. <laughs> <laughs> That's embarrassing. You can't sneak into a meeting that way, right? No, except for, you know, they had the slide share, screen share going, so you only saw a few people on the side, oh. so you weren't really sure who it was, but <laughs> still. Or I thought it wouldn't, would never happen with Zoom, but I was on a call yesterday and someone put us on hold. I guess they were calling in on the phone and then put us on hold. I thought, no, not that old conference call stuff again. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've got uh, two minutes past 10. So we will get started right now. Uh, so uh, my name is Tony Ferlenda and I am the Director of Consulting with Dana. And uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, with us today is Stephanie Corey, who is a Dana consultant. And uh, she'll walk us uh, through the next hour or so. But if we could, and if it's okay with you, Stephanie, uh, would, I would uh, like folks to have the opportunity to, to introduce themselves. Oh, yes, certainly. Absolutely. And um, I'm just going to go in order uh, of folks who are on my screen. And uh, we will start with uh, what looks like Jay Beckley. Uh, hi, this is John Beckley. 
I'm the uh, Director of Development and Marketing with AIDS Delaware. Welcome, John. April? You're muted, April. All right, we'll try Cindy. Good morning, my name is Cindy Young and I'm the volunteer coordinator for a wave of healthy meals. Great, thank you, Cindy. Sharon, you're muted. who are shy. Michelle? Michelle, we can't hear you. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to step away. Anyone who wants to introduce themselves, Step up. Hi, good morning. My name is Patience Cunningham. I am a financial development coordinator with PHDM Ministries. Welcome. Thank you. And April just put in the chat, not sure if she called on me. She was away momentarily, so maybe she's ready to introduce herself. Okay. Yes. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so my name is April Pagliasati. I am a relatively new hire over at West Side Grows Together. Um, and I am the new uh, community development manager. And um, this is my first uh, foray into the nonprofit world um, as an employee. So, you know, I'm excited to learn about um, some more compelling grant writing and, and expanding my skill set. So, thanks for having me. Great. Thank you for joining. Thanks, April. My name is Donna Morawski, and I'm uh, president of the Milton Community Food Pantry. Good morning. Hi, I'm Rebecca Rudy, and I'm Executive Director of Mid-Atlantic Orphan Care Coalition. Thank you. Good morning, I am Darren Silvis. I am the Development Director at the Freeman Stage in Selbyville, Delaware. Welcome. Hi, I'm Noelle Dietrich, and I am the Director of Advancement and Communications for Wilmington Montessori School. Hi, I'm Michelle Kane. I'm the executive assistant to the CEO at KSI. Okay. Good morning. I think we have everyone, Stephanie. Thanks everyone for taking the time to introduce yourselves. I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie. Um, welcome, Stephanie. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome to Grant Writing, Telling a Compelling Story. And given that we have a pretty small group with us live today, feel free to jump in if you have a question. Either just start talking or, you know, put something in the chat because um, I don't have my view where I can see all of you because I need to see my slides. But feel free to jump on in. And in case you hear any off stage directions in um, Labrador speak, that's Rocco, the director. <laughs> and just to give you a little bit about my background so you're not thinking, who is this lady and why is she qualified to talk about this? I've written grants for, and my first job as a program manager, then as a development director, executive director, and consultant. So I've been writing grants professionally for a long time now, 17 years. I've done federal grants as well as state grants in Delaware, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, grants from national and local corporate foundations, and then private foundations throughout Delaware and Pennsylvania. I've also been on the other side of things and been a grant reviewer. I've done that for the United Way of Chester County, as well as for the Christmas Shop Foundation. So I've seen what others are doing, the good, the bad, the ugly, the unfundable, the fundable. And today we're gonna cover what you need to do to prepare to complete a grant application, the most common types of information you'll be asked to provide, the key components of an effective case for support, and some tips and tricks for engaging people who may not be familiar with your organization, because that's one of the hardest parts, especially now with so many online grant applications and those dreaded word and character limits. I was doing a grant the other day for a client and there were 500 characters to describe what you do. 
And 500 characters is not very much to really cover a human services organization that has a variety of services. So first of all, preparing to write a grant. You want to think about how you manage the process. I really recommend having an annual calendar of grants. And quite frankly, I, I mean an actual paper calendar. I like the big wall calendars where you can see all 12 months at one time. So on there, you can put all of your due dates for grants, all of your due dates for reports. So you can see and easily you know, count back to when you need to get started, see when your busy season is you know, maybe not have a special event at your organization if it's going to be in the middle of a busy week where you have five grants due. And then it's also important to figure out at your organization who decides when and where you're going to apply and what are you going to apply for. So is that your executive director, development director, program director, who is that? I would recommend it's a collaborative process. So you make sure you're putting your most competitive proposals forward. And then who sets your organizational priorities? Likely it is the board. So you wanna make sure that there's communication about what should be funded before other initiatives. And you'll definitely wanna prepare for funder outreach. Now, a lot of funders hide from us nowadays. You've probably had that experience where you've gone to the website, you can't find a phone number, it's just a generic email address, but some funders actually do wanna hear from you. But first, you definitely wanna research if your organization has contacted the funder before and what proposals you've submitted, because the funder will probably have a record of that and you wanna make sure that you're coming from a place of knowing what you've done in the past. And you definitely want to read all of the funders guidelines and materials, because while I'm sure they're not going to answer all of the questions you have, you don't want to appear like you didn't do that research first. And you want to understand fully the project that you want funded. So if the funder asks a lot of questions about it, you can answer them intelligently. And if you're the kind of person that gets nervous on the phone with someone important, you might even want to rehearse what you're going to say. And when you do the call and the email, depending on how the funder likes to be contacted or whichever one you can find, you wanna introduce your organization, the project or program you want funded, and be prepared to share why you think it's a good fit and, and ask relevant questions. And this is a chance to gauge the funder's interest. And then it's also a chance to ask for a meeting or a chance to submit what's called an LOI, a letter of intent, or letter of inquiry. So here you really wanna see from your sense of the call or email, how interested they are, if they tell you, well, go look at our FAQs on the website, or they're willing to even look at a draft proposal, which I believe some funders might still do, but it's, it's few and, and far between. But definitely don't be afraid to try to start a relationship with a funder. The worst they can do is ignore you. And once you're ready to start writing your grant, you definitely need to get certain information ready before you begin. So common proposal elements that you're gonna need to have would be that letter of inquiry, letter of intent, and some funders don't give you any guidance. They're like, just send us an LOI. And you're like, okay, well, do you want one page, two pages, three pages? What do you wanna know? Others are very prescribed in what they want from you. So letter of inquiry, if they indicate they want one, and then for most grants, if you're able to still you know, email it or mail it a cover letter, some funders will ask for an executive summary, but most proposals, even online ones, do want a narrative. So they want to know what goals and objectives you have for your program and how you're planning to achieve them. And really big now is program evaluation and measuring outcomes. So it's more than just outputs, how many people received your service, but what difference it's making in the lives of people or you know, if you're an animal shelter, um, animals. And then a lot of times you'll be asked to identify key staff who will be working on the project. And then the timeline for completion, which a lot of times if it's an ongoing program, your answer is ongoing. But if it's something, maybe it's a pilot program, you would have a timeline or obviously for a capital project. And another question that's pretty common is what challenges do you anticipate during the grant period? And here you want to be 
honest, but you don't want to scare the funder. So common challenges could be, um, you know, lack of perhaps registrations for your program, or it could be um, an inability to obtain all of the funding needed for the program. And the fun question we all love answering is what are your sustainability plans? How do you plan to continue this program after the funding period? And here, I think we all have the same answer, which is we will be approaching new funders, um, you know, other institutional funders, do, approaching individual donors, holding events, and, and doing the like to continue the program. Because funders would like to see that after their period of funding is over, that the program's not just going to wilt and die away. And then some of the basic documents you're going to need to put together the grant would be an organizational bio. And I see something in the chat. Glad you mentioned sustainability, Stephanie. Cool. All right. So your bio. So sort of the, you know, brief history about your programs. I would say maybe a one pager you can pull from depending on how much space you have in a given grant application. And everyone wants your board list. Now, I don't think they need the home addresses on it, but you could certainly, if you'd like to, if you're a statewide organization and you want to show statewide representation, certainly you can put the cities they live in. And, you know, it might be helpful if you include what their professions are, uh, but it, it's up to you. Um, it could just be names. And then it's helpful to have brief bios for the staff and volunteers that would be involved in a program or project. Again, not that many funders ask for these nowadays, but they're good to have on hand. You're definitely going to need a copy of your 501c3 letter. And I actually had one funder years ago, I think it was one of the United Ways, request a newer one because the one the organization had from the IRS was about 10 years old. So you can call the IRS any time, wait on hold for a while, and get a new letter sent that just has a new issue date on it, but the date, obviously, that you received your 501c3 status doesn't change. You're going to need your budget, and here it's going to be an organizational budget, and I would recommend if your budget is like four pages long and it's every little thing that has its own line item, to consolidate that into common categories that will make sense to a funder, like salaries and wages. You don't need it broken down by department on an organizational budget. And it could just be travel. You wouldn't need to have it broken down by, you know, mileage reimbursement, plane fare, conference travel, things like that. So make it easy for the, the funder to understand. And you'll need your current financial statements. So these would be your internally prepared financial statements. And again, as current as you can possibly send the funder, and you're also going to need your most recent audited financial statements. And I know for some smaller organizations, you don't have an audit completed, and that can be a challenge. So there I would recommend that you state, you know, our budget size of $100,000 precludes us from affording an audit, and the standards for excellence really don't you know, don't require an audit for organizations with less than 500000 in revenue. As we grow, we certainly plan on engaging the services of an independent auditor, but we rep believe that our internally prepared financial statements fairly represent our financial position. You're also going to need the most recent copy of your IRS Form 990, and you don't have to send them the end part that has all of your 5,000 and up donors. That does not need to go to the funders. And then sometimes funders will want letters of support or agreement, or maybe a copy of a memorandum of understanding if you're talking about partners. So those would be handy to have on hand because sometimes they can take a little time to get from someone. And if you publish an annual report, definitely a copy of your most recent annual report. And in your organizational bio, that would be a page, two tops, but again, something that you can pull from depending on the space you have in the grant would be your mission statement. I'd also add your vision statement if you have that, a brief description of your programs and services. So if you could really get that down to maybe a paragraph or two, the geographic area served, the demographics of those you served, serve. And that's important because I was actually working on a grant the other day for a client and they were very interested, funder was very interested in how many folks were different income levels. 
And then, you know, how long you've been around and, and major milestones. Maybe you had a name change or maybe you've moved locations. Who your leadership is, your total annual budget, where your funding comes from. And obviously, the more diverse that is, the more funders want to hear that. So you could explain that you receive some government funding, corporations and foundations, individuals, membership dues, you know, whatever your funding sources are, and where the money goes. So obviously programs and services, but also if you are doing a big, um, you know, infrastructure improvements, you can certainly explain that, that, you know, you're in the process of upgrading your IT, and then just the, the broad number of staff and volunteers that work for your organization. And you want to, before you start writing a grant, make sure you understand your organization, the program, and your potential funder. Uh, and a lot of funders who do have their own websites, they're really good at telling you what they're all about and what they're interested in. So then it's up to you to make your program fit their criteria. And not talking about changing your program, but using their language and highlighting what the match is. So for example, it, um, Canine Partners for Life, where my dog Rocco um, was released from, they train service dogs to help people with disabilities. So if the funder they're approaching really is, in, is focused on people with disabilities, it'd be more about the service recipients. If they're writing to Purina for um, a grant, the focus would be more on the dog's needs for nutrition. And in your proposal, you're gonna to wanna to answer who, what, when, where, why, and how. So who will be implementing the program, project, et cetera? What staff will be involved? Or if it's capital improvements, have you selected the contractor? And who will benefit from your program? And here you wanna be specific, so the demographics. So if you are a literacy program, is it school-aged children? Is it adults? Is it um, non-native speakers who are learning the language? So be specific about who you're helping. And again, depending on the fund interest, you could certainly be asking for funding for a specific service uh, recipient type. So if it's a funder that's interested in um, helping immigrants integrate and you do run a literacy program, you could highlight your ESL component and ask for funding for that. And you want to be specific in what you're proposing to do because the funder really probably doesn't know what you do or even if you happen to work for an organization that has good brand recognition, there are a lot of no one really understands what an organization does, even the American Red Cross. We, you know, we think of blood drives, we think of emergency response to big disasters, but you know, they do so much more than that. And that's something they have to uh, communicate to funders too. And I think it's also important to be able to answer what would happen if your program didn't exist or you weren't able to do your capital improvements. You know, would you, how many, clients would you have to turn away? You know, would you have so many more expenses trying to maintain your current facility versus the new one you wanted to build? So really explaining why it's important to get that funding now. And then the win is, what's your detailed timeline, which is a question funders often ask. And if it's an ongoing program, that's a little more challenging to answer because it's ongoing. But if it's something new, you could certainly say, okay, well, we plan to start it in September. We'll recruit program participants in October. We'll evaluate it in December. That cohort will end in February. We'll recruit a new cohort for May, you know, explanations like that. And then the where, obviously, if it's a capital improvement, easy answer. And then the program. So you could explain, you know, in the community, at your facility. And there, you know, depending on the funder, you might really want to stress how far your outreach goes, that maybe you're not just one county in Delaware, you're all three. And the why, why should you receive the support? So I think we've all gotten rejection letters from foundations. Oh, we received so many qualified proposals. We're sorry to tell you yours isn't one of them. Okay, yes, I'm sure they received more proposals than they had in money, but were you rejected because you happened to be number five and they funded number four or because you wrote a crabby proposal? You don't, you don't know until you ask them, which you can, and sometimes you'll get some good feedback. But you want to really stress, you know, why your organization is 
you know, the one to deliver the program. And some funders even ask, you know, who else is like you and how do you differ? So there you really want to stress why you. And impact is something that funders are really focusing on, not the numbers you're serving, but the difference you're making. And I know depending on the type of program you have, that can be so hard to measure impact, but it's something that you need to find a way to do now. And then it's important to stress urgency. You don't want to stress urgency like if we don't get this grant, we're going to have to shut down the program, but you want to stress the need for your program. And I know that can be hard because um, I was working with a client yesterday, not on grants, and it's an arts and culture organization. We were talking about how do they go ask individuals for money right now when there are so many you know, basic needs issues going on, um, so many organizations dealing with, you know, the issues of, of racial tension, and, and here they are, an arts and culture organization. And I told them, you know, to me, the, the, the thing with arts and culture is you want those organizations to be around when the world calms down again. That's what the why now is. And then your funders will want to know how you're going to implement your program and how you're going to evaluate it. So whether you're going to evaluate it through self-report surveys that your participants are going to um, complete, whether it's going to be staff evaluating, you know, the change in condition of your program participants, whether you have it in your budget to hire a professional evaluator to come in and develop a system, they're going to want to know how you're going to get your program going, and how you're going to measure your success. And online applications, which are more and more popular, those super fun character limits. So I would definitely pay attention to whether it's word or character so you know when you're typing, because the one I mentioned with 500 characters the other day, it didn't mention characters or words. I had to start typing in the field to figure out which it was. And I've noticed that sometimes the word count in Microsoft Word doesn't match the word count on funders' online applications. So make sure you leave time to adjust and remove adjectives as needed. And you definitely want to pay attention to required fields on online applications because Sometimes you can't even skip to the next page to see what you're going to have to answer without putting something there. So be prepared to have a typical placeholder that you'll know that you have to go back and answer if you have to put required fields in before you can advance to the next one. And definitely typing the answers in Word with spell check and then cutting and pasting is a great way to save time. Plus, you have everything saved because the grant, the grant application the other day that had the 500 character limit to talk about what the organization does. Also, you couldn't say, you didn't log in and save it. You just did it right there one fell swoop. So certainly being prepared and having all of the documentation ready worked. And certainly I recommend bookmarking online applications so they're easy to find and get to again. And I keep um, a Google Drive that I share with the client I've been working on for, with grants, where we have a track, you know, when's the grant due, you know, the uh, link for the application, what the password is, what the login is, you know, to really make it simple so anyone can get into it at any time. And are there any questions before we transition to case for support? Okay, hearing none, I will move on. So your case for support is really all about you and, and as an organization and what you're about. So what, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Is it homelessness? Is it food insecurity? Is it um, education? And then why should a donor care about it? And this is the case, whether it's a foundation funder or an individual donor, sort of the what's in it for them or what's in it for society if they're going to support you. And then what are you doing about the problem? So talking about your programs in the sense of what they're accomplishing. And then what can a donor do? Obviously, make a donation. But certainly some funders, especially if you're looking at corporate foundations, they're interested also sometimes in volunteer opportunities for their employees. So that's certainly something that you might want to address is how you can employ uh, volunteers. And then the urgency, why should a donor give now? Why now, not next year or five years from now? 
And again, sort of the, the converse, what happens if a donor doesn't give? Would there be, you know, rampant homeless pets running around, reproducing, making the problem worse? Would um, the students you support, would the graduation rates go down? And what does success look like for your organization? So for some organizations, like I used to work for a chapter of the Alzheimer's Association, our vision was a world without Alzheimer's. So success would be a cure. Now, for some organizations, you're never going to be potentially out of business like that. But success would look like higher graduation rates or less homeless pets or reduced food insecurity in your service area. Success like that. And in your case for support, you want to focus on what makes you uniquely qualified. There's a lot of competition out there in the nonprofit sector and organizations that may at first glance appear to be doing the same work as you're doing are probably applying to the same funders and funders need to decide who are we going to fund. Okay, so there's this um, reading program and there's this reading program. We don't want to fund two reading programs which one is the stronger one and why. So you wanna focus on maybe the expertise of your staff, your long history, whatever makes you uniquely qualified as an organization. And then you want to be specific. You want to talk about exactly what you do so someone from the outside can understand it. And again, that sense of urgency. And what might be helpful as you're putting together your case for support is getting people that aren't on the complete inside like you involved. So maybe asking volunteers, you know, their thoughts, getting your board involved, what do they think makes you unique? And it's generally pretty interesting to compare all the answers and see the similarities and differences. And it gives you a good perspective. And obviously in our times of COVID, um, in-person brainstorming sessions aren't feasible, but there are certainly some great techniques for doing it virtually or even having people do it individually and then submitting their answers. And when you have your case, you wanna evaluate it. You wanna make sure it's concise. You don't want to use too many extra words. You wanna get right to the point and you wanna make sure it's oriented to the reader more than the organization. Even though it's all about you, you want the reader to feel like it's speaking to them and how they can help. And you wanted to emphasize opportunities for the funder rather than your need as an organization. And you wanna make sure you present the information in a logical order. And obviously what might be logical to me might not be logical to you. So the more sets of eyes you can get on it, the better. You wanna make sure it doesn't sound like it was written by 10 people. So I would really encourage, you know, when, when you have all the ideas there and everyone's happy with the ideas to perhaps have your best writer make it sound like it's one voice and then get your best set of eagle eyes proofreader on it. And it's also important that your case shows that your what you're planning will work. You wanna make sure that you've done your research, that you have um, maybe evidence-based programs or interventions that you're doing, that you're not just making up your programs on the fly. Any questions about cases for support before we talk about how to engage your reviewers? Okay, so please, 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 please watch the acronyms and jargon. I know it's really hard, especially if it's organizations, we have super long names and we're with an, uh, doing an online application, we only have so many characters or words. So certainly the first time you introduce your organization, spell it all out. And then if you need to save space, you know, definitely you know, use an acronym that makes sense. And then if your program names are really long, again, if the acronym makes sense, um, and definitely avoid jargon. We have a lot of that in the nonprofit sector. So write to someone, as if they know nothing about you and they don't know any of your terminology. And use the funder's language. So if they say participants, you say participants. They say goal, you say goal. They say objective, you say objective. So go with how the language they're using. 
because that's how, you know, in a way they see the world and the words they're looking for. And then say what you need to say to communicate what you want to communicate and then just stop. Concise is better and follow all published directions. If it tells you to attach something as a PDF, do it as a PDF. If they tell you to mail three copies, you better mail three copies. If they tell you, you know, whatever they tell you to do, follow those directions or you're automatically going to end up in the it's not going to happen pile for, for a very silly reason. And then definitely give enough background to help your reviewers understand your organization and your program. And I know with online applications, that's getting harder and harder because of word limits. And many times the word limits don't even make sense. You get 500 words for your mission and then 500 words to describe your whole organization. So my uh, you know, plea to funders would be to think about the amount of space they're allocating to you to answer each question. But until that changes, you know, answer each question the best you can. And sometimes, and this is a little sneaky, with the online applications, if you have extra space in one section, but you know, you blew through it all in another, maybe you can incorporate some of that information you wanted to share in that section where, there, uh, where, you, where you had some space, as long as it's not totally out there and doesn't relate. But that's a sneaky way to get more of what you wanted to say in there. And Rocco's telling you, please, please, please avoid those acronyms and jargon. And what I learned as a reviewer is please ask for an appropriate amount of money. Do your research. Um, hopefully everyone's familiar with GuideStar. It's guidestar.org. You can create a free account and go in there and see the 990s for all um, nonprofits. So you can look up every funder and what you'll generally find is um, a list of grants they've given. Now the 990s tend to be a couple years behind, but you can see, okay, wow, the largest grant they gave was $10,000 and the average grant size was 2000. I'm a new applicant, maybe I shouldn't ask for 20,000. And then, you know, a lot of times funders that have websites they maintain will post grant recipients on there. So you can see who's been awarded and in what amounts. So you can certainly ask for above average, but I certainly wouldn't shoot for the moon unless you've had a conversation with that funder and they've recommended that is the appropriate ask. And please don't hand write your application. I saw this a lot at the Christmas Shop Foundation where it was a word, it was either a Word or PDF document that um, organizations were supplied with. And some people, I mean, they had beautiful penmanship, but it was still handwritten, which is a lot harder than taking the time to, you know, type it in a PDF or a, a Word document. You know, even if a funder has the most antiquated application, you know, that it's like a Xerox of a Xerox, you know, maybe pull out the old typewriter and type it if, if they're that old fashioned instead of doing um, a handwritten application. And then ask for something the funder will fund. Many times funders will tell you things like, we will not do capital improvements or we will not fund staff salaries. If they tell you that, don't ask for something that they don't fund. Now, certainly in whatever budget you submit to them for your program, you wanna show all of your actual program expenses, but when you're asking for their support, make sure you specify, you know, if they don't cover staff time, you might say, you know, we're asking for $5,000 from you to purchase the materials for our after school program or to provide lunches for the students at summer camp. And then if the funder reaches out to you, please respond. If they have a question, if they're nice enough to let you know you forgot something, if they're following up about a report, please respond to them. Don't ignore them. I can tell you that that will move you to the no pile immediately if you're non-responsive or you're viewed as kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, grantee because there is so much competition out there. You don't want to get kicked to the no pile for a silly reason. You want to end up in the no pile simply because there wasn't enough money to go around. 
And I have some final tips because I wanted to leave lots of time for questions and discussion. So don't wait until the last minute because anything that can go wrong will, you know, your server will crash. The person that was going to give you the budget, you know, isn't in that day. So I really advise pretending that a grant deadline is really a week or two before it really is. So you have time for those issues. And certainly, you know, if you are waiting until the last minute, know what time the deadline really is. Does that grant close at 5 p.m. on June 30th or is it midnight on June 30th? I've actually had to call and ask a funder once because I was waiting for a document from a partner on the grant and there was, was nothing I could do about it, you know, except wait. Um, so I needed to know what the time really was because we were, were, were running quite late and keep a copy of everything so you know what you submitted to that funder. You know, certainly an electronic copy is great. Unfortunately, I guess I kill a lot of trees. What I often um, did, I developed a little half sheet um, paper that, you know, I would attach to my copy of every grant application submitted, even electronic ones, I would print out a copy and it would have the date of submission and little check boxes for, did we send the 990? Did we send the annual report? Did we send the, you know, all those little attachments that are pretty much standard. So that way I know what we sent and it was a verification that we'd sent it. And then I put that in the grant file. And don't request an inappropriate amount of money. Again, do your, your research on what is appropriate for a given funder. Get respond to funders when they reach out to you and do have an outsider review your grant. So this is not someone within your organization. Maybe it can be one of your family members or friends who can read it from that perspective of, do I understand what you're trying to say? Am I correctly under, you know, interpreting what your program does? You know, not, and sure they can have, you know, tell you if they found a typo, but it's more for, are you doing a good job of telling your story? And a lot of times with grants, once you have a good template, it's really cutting and pasting and making it fit um, each funder's application. So you don't have to do that for every grant. Um, it would be in a perfect world, yes. But when you have your basic template, that's what I would definitely have an outsider review for that confirmation of understanding. And I wanted to find out, you know, if you had any takeaways or aha moments today as we open it up for discussion and questions. And I'm going to put it where I can see everybody now. Or those of you that, okay, so it's basically just Tony that has his camera on. But, you know, wh what resonated with you today? What what are you going to take back with you to the office and say, okay, I'm definitely going to start doing this now or stop doing it if you had a bad habit? Stephanie, this is Darren from the Freeman Stage. Thank you for all of this. I think one thing that's really important to highlight is doing the research around the funder and really dig down into their priorities and their interests and mm -hmm. see where your impact and mission align with those and really try to craft a really strong response tying those two together. Yeah, no, definitely. And then I think now, you know, I would recommend maybe outreach to funders just to make sure that are you are your priorities still the same or with COVID-19, have you shifted priorities? Because you don't want to waste your time preparing a grant application if it's no longer competitive at that funder. So Stephanie, um, first of all, Great job, very comprehensive, um, but very easy to understand. You laid it out very well. Thank you for doing that. What advice are you giving to organizations today? You mentioned um, you're working with an arts organization, which I have several clients uh, who are in that, um, that area, and they're struggling now with trying to find um, opportunities for funding. Um, are you counseling them to do anything different today as opposed to what they might have done six months ago? Well, I think you know, now it's, it's for many organizations, unfortunately, it's about survival and talking about the need to just 
get to where they can start doing programming again. I know some organizations have been able to pivot and deliver a lot of programming virtually, but that's not the case for, for some organizations. And then, you know, some have certainly had to furlough staff, lay off staff, others have been able to keep everybody, but the issue is keeping them, them busy. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's really to have those conversations with your funders that have been supporting you over the long term and, and being honest about what your challenges are. And right now might not be the best time to reach out to new funders because they're probably focused on supporting those organizations that have been with them for a while in these times of crisis. But, you know, if you do happen upon a new funder or you already had someone on your, your calendar, you know, definitely go for it. And I think you certainly can't avoid the elephant in the room. So you would have to address, you know, what changes you've had to make, you know, due to COVID-19. Oh, and, and Steve is asking, in your vast experience, are there any funders who would help an organization go virtual? You know, I can't... You know, I know um, the Longwood Foundation does a lot of help with organizations with capacity building and infrastructure improvements. So they might be a good choice and, and they fund in Delaware. Um, they um, are pretty strict about deadlines as well as making you take um, some time off between applying whether you were awarded a grant or not. But they're also one of the funders that will have a conversation with you. So they will tell you, don't waste your time or yes, that sounds good, we're interested. Um, otherwise, what I would recommend um, would be a trip to, although I guess, how do we do it in this, these times? Um, it would have been a trip to um, you know, the University of Delaware, whether it's the Location Community Services Building or the actual campus, to use Foundation Center to research potential new funders, but I don't think either is open right now. And a subscription to Foundation Center isn't exactly cheap but maybe you can sign up for a month to month one and just really maximize the, the month of, of time with it. Um, and, you know, cause that's one thing we're not so good at sharing in the nonprofit sector. We don't like to share who, our funders. So other organizations in your same space might not be willing to tell you where they've gotten the money, but that's where I really find that checking out other organizations that are similar to you, looking at their websites or their annual reports if they publish them and seeing who's funded them, because those are a great potential funders to look at. Now, many times you get all excited and then you go check out the 990 only to find out, oh yes, everyone's favorite, no unsolicited proposals accepted which just ruins your day when you think you found a great funder who, you know, seems to love organizations that are, are like yours, then you see those dreadful words. Oh, and Julie has a tip to share. Yeah, go ahead, Hi. Julie. Hi, Stephanie, how are you? Um, Julie are you? Caravan from Habitat. I just wanted to um, make sure everybody was aware that the Philadelphia Free Library has the essential version of um, the foundation directory available online for free for the oh. period of time that they're closed. Um, and as you said, it is quite expensive to subscribe to, you know, to that. So I would encourage everybody to log on and take advantage of that resource. That is a great tip. Thank you. And you don't have to be a Philadelphia resident to access it? No, well, you can get it right online at the website. Um, you know, traditionally you had to have a Philadelphia library card. Mm -hmm. in go and use the um, Foundation Center there and some of the services they offer, which includes some great professional development trainings, you know, obviously virtual now, previously in person. Um, but right now, because everything's closed up, it's just available online. So check out their website. Yeah, it's called Foundation Center. Is right, that Foundation Center. Julie, that was the Philadelphia Library? Correct. Let me see if I can find the link and put it in the chat. Oh, awesome. that'd be great. Awesome. And and Cindy's asking, please explain the difference between project versus program. So my definition, program is something more ongoing. Like if you are a, um, you know, literacy program, you'd have your, liter your, your programs would be ongoing. And a project might be a special um, conference or something that you'd be putting on for teachers who teach literacy. So something that is more of a, a one-time kind, of kind of event. 
Um, so the client I was referencing, we um, found a funder that is very interested in faith-based issues related to mental health and they provide mental health support. So um, we're proposing a conference for um, faith-based communities to learn more about mental health. So I describe that more as a project than a program because it hopefully it a, becomes a biannual thing if, if we can get the funding for, for the first one. And funders might be calling it a project and you're really doing a program or vice versa. So go with their language, even if you know yours is the other one. I have a question. This is sure. April from, uh, what's that gross together? Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, so, I mean, obviously I said I'm like very new and, you know, I've Googled some, some resources, but I was wondering if, um, if you or anybody else had any good um, like websites or otherwise, um, because you know, I'm I'm kind of an example-based learner quite often. So, if there was any good, like, kind of one-stop shop for like um, grant writing and and resources for that sort of thing, you know, probably there would be the, um, the Grant Professional Association mm -hmm. probably has some resources. I know the Association of Fundraising Professionals does, and that would be afpglobal.org. You have to be a member to access most of them on AFP. I don't know about Grant um, Professionals Association. Oh, great, Julie's sharing the free library link. Thank you so much, Julie. So those um, associations would have some great resources. Um, I would also think that, you know, um, you know, Dana does a, does a lot of trainings um, where we, we cover elements related to grants. But if you're looking, and there are some books out there, I don't have a particular one to recommend because someone asked me a couple months ago, I said, I don't know. I, you know, looked on Amazon and there were, were a whole bunch of them. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the only real change I, I've seen in, 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 in how to write grants over 17 years of doing it is the switch to online and those dang word limits. And the, and the greater focus on impact and outcomes versus just outputs and increased um, reporting requirements are the, the big changes I've seen. Thank you so much. Stephanie, please honor Rebecca Rudy's request. What, what request was that? I didn't see the, oh, repeat the name of the resource. Yeah, that's, think, that's called the Foundation Center. Yeah, Foundation Center. Okay, Rebecca says we covered. All right, we're okay. good. What other questions can I can I answer? Or if anyone else has any great resources to share? Other than the names of your funders, I know you're not going to share that. <laughs> Stephanie, this has been so helpful. I really appreciate it. Um, another definition uh, request, please. Input versus... Uh, what was it? Input. Output, output versus outcomes? Yes, yes, output versus outcome. So um, what kind of, what, what's one of your programs you do, Cindy, at your organization? We're a service organization and we prepare healthy meals for um, people who are in cancer treatment. Okay, so your output would be how many meals you served. Okay. Your outcome would be the difference that makes. So, and that could be a little harder to measure. So do they have increased resiliency? Do they have, um, you know, better, obviously, you know, what difference does it make in terms of their nutrition? Um, so it's the difference it makes in the lives of those you serve. And that can be a little harder, I think, in that program versus measuring the number of meals. Actually, I think we've got that down pat pretty, you know, down pat pretty much, but the outcome is the harder part because um, yeah. it's hard to measure that. And we're doing, we're tackling that by surveys and things like that um, from the recipients. Oh, and that's great because then you could say, you know, 90% of participants indicated this, 75% indicated this. The, the program I wrote grants for when I worked at the Arc of Chester County, one of the programs, and it was the easiest program to explain the outcomes for. It was an employment program for people with disabilities. So it was how many got jobs, how many kept jobs, how many received a raise. So, mm. I mean, those were like, wow, those were great outcomes that were so easily measurable. Perfect. And then, and um, this, will the slides be sent out? I believe Dana will be sending the slides out, Tony. Okay. Yes. Yes. 
And Andre is asking, will there ever be a time when a funder will require an organization to do a program of their liking to receive funds for the overall organization's needs? I would like to hope not. Normally, it seems to be the organizations trying to tailor something to meet the, the funder's interests, not the funder saying, well, you know, I want you to do this and then I'll give you money. Now, individual donors sometimes behave like that with, with pet projects they're interested in, but generally, you know, foundation funders aren't going to require you to, you know, you're going to present what you want to do to them. They may come back to you and say, well, we would be interested if this. And hopefully what they would be, you know, suggesting wouldn't be too different from what you were proposing. But normally I, I find that funders are just, no, if it, it wasn't to their liking, they're not really willing to, to work with you on that. Because again, there, there's so much competition out there now. And a trick for everybody, if you don't want to lose that link um, to the free library, there's the three little dots at the bottom of the chat. It saves the chat as a text file on your computer. Great tip. I'm, I'm learning all about Zoom in these last few months. <laughs> and we have time for a couple more questions. So I, I want to respect everyone's time. And Julie's sharing her contact information. If anyone has any questions, that's great. And I will, um, you're, you're getting the slides, but you know, here's my contact information as well as Paul Stock, um, who is at Dana and oversees consulting. Because if you, um, and, and uh, you know, Tony is the director of consulting. So if you're, you know, if your organization needs help with something, I would definitely reach out to Dana and they'll help partner you with a consultant that has the skill set to help you with what you need, whether, you know, it's, it's getting a grant writing program going, it's, it's a retreat for your staff, for your board, whatever you need, Dana can help connect you in the right direction. Shameless, <laughs> shameless plug there, but you definitely want to take advantage of your, your Dana membership. And another resource would be, you know, the Grant Professionals Association. I believe they're trying to start a chapter up in Delaware. And then the Association of Funders and Professionals um, Brandywine chapter um, does cover all of Delaware and offers programming on all types of fundraising, not specifically grant writing, although that is a topic that we do, um, the chapter does cover. And what's been the shortest time application to funding have you done? What is the usual average time? Oh my goodness. I've actually had one come back 18 months later after applying where we've like written them off. Like, okay, you know, they, it's not, not every funder even gets back to you. That's the worst. And Julie's saying 10 days. That's awesome. I think now for a lot of the COVID grants, the response time is a lot quicker than normal, but normally it's, you know, it depends on the deadline because for a lot of funders, you know, if the deadline's April 30th, they need to get the committee together, the board together. That's probably sometime in May. So generally a couple months is what I'm finding is, is the, the average time. And certainly for funders, they're like, we don't have a deadline. Just send it in whenever. You don't know when they're meeting. And, and deciding. So for those, it's, it's, it's a little harder to, to figure out. And again, you know, I've had funders that, you know, never let you know either way. So sort of like a unpaid pledge, you just have to, you know, take it off your, your list of uh, pending grants, which I think is very rude. Can they not even send an email saying thank you, but no. And then um, the end of year cycles tend to be bigger awards than spring. Um, you know, I don't know. That is a really good question. You know, I think in terms of funders that have, you know, different deadlines, it's really, I would go with the one that works best for you and your timing and thinking about when the award would be coming to you and, you know, what your fiscal year timing is. I mean, that would be interesting. Um, Maybe we should, you know, that, that'd be a good research project if the funders would actually share that with us. But I would, you know, I would certainly, if you're not ready for, you know, one deadline, don't submit something that's, that's not good 
just wait until the next deadline because you don't want to give the funder the impression that that is what you think a quality product is if it's not ready. And for funders that like Longwood Foundation that make you wait, you don't want to blow that chance. And just because of market and end of year tax filing, um, well, you know, funders probably have a sense at the beginning of the year how much they're going to be giving out. There may be some fluctuations in, you know, in the fall, if, you know, depending on the market. But if the market tanks, there's probably going to be less they're giving out in the fall versus if there are market gains and they feel like, okay, we can be a little extra generous. And again, um, I know like the Christmas Shop Foundation, we knew exactly how much we were giving away because we would raise it at an event and we knew we had X amount to distribute to all of the grantees. But certainly for foundations, there is the requirement, you know, of the 5%, but that does include any expenses they have, not just grant awards. And some are more conservative and want to just hoard away as much money as they can. And, and others um, do seem more compelled to meet the needs of the organizations they're funding and be a little more generous, especially in, in, in tough times like we have now with high unemployment rates and the ability for so many organizations to deliver their services. We have one more question for Stephanie. All right, almost the top of the hour, Stephanie. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, thank you so all for joining us. Uh, to reiterate, um, uh, if you uh, want to reconnect with Stephanie, uh, just reach out to Dana, and we will do that for you. Uh, the slides will be coming to you uh, sometime in the next 24 hours or so. But uh, thank you all, and thank you very much, Stephanie, for your time. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Have great, a great job. Day. Great job. Fantastic. Oh, Have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye. -bye.